Hi everyone and welcome to church today. So glad you could join with us. My name's Jono. I'm part of the team here at One Hope and I want to say a special welcome to those of you that maybe you're sitting by yourself today and you're like feeling a bit lonely and you're kind of like, oh, this thing's kind of, you know, really taking a toll on you. I want to encourage you today that you're not, uh, you might be sitting there by yourself, but you're not worshipping by yourself. And as Pastor Matt comes up on in a minute, you know, we're, we're not, you're not opening the Bible by yourself. Actually, you got your church family around you and uh, they're there's a bunch of us who are doing this, even though we might be, you know, physically separated. We're in one spirit today. And so that's exciting. And so hope that this time is an encouragement to you, that it builds you up in your faith, that like I said, we're not doing something just by ourselves. God's called us into an amazing church family. You're a part of this. We can't do it by ourselves. And so even as you might be, you know, wherever you are today, that you're playing a part in what God wants to do in our lives. And particularly in your life. And so we're going to celebrate that today. We're going to sing with faith and uh, Boaz and Anna are going to lead us. And so I encourage you that wherever you are, sing along, hum along, mime along, whatever it is, uh, why don't we dedicate this time in our hearts to God and just say, God, come and have your way in our lives. We want to meet with you today and do something special in us through the gift of Jesus Christ. So why don't we do that together, church? Come on, we sing this out. Passion of our Savior, the mercy of our God, the cross that leaves no question after measure of His love. Come on, we sing this out. Our chains are gone. Our chains are gone. Our dead is pain, the cross has overthrown the grave. For Jesus' blood that sets us free means death to death and life for me. The innocent judge guilty. Guilty one walks free. Death would be his portion, and our portion liberty. Oh, our chains are gone, our dead is paid, the cross has overthrown. Sets 
us free means death to death and life for means death means death to death and life for me yes lord in psalm 139 it says that god knew us when we were in our mother's womb he knew us before we were even even out in the world and He knows every word that's on our lips before we even say it. And He loves us. He sees all our faults. He sees everything. He sees what we live with and He loves us. And that love is, we can't escape it. Wherever we try and run and, and hide, maybe because it's guilt or shame, God just wants to come in and fill that place with, with His love, fill that spot in our heart with His love. And we just thank You, God. We thank You. We thank You today for that love, for that incredible love, that unconditional love. We recognise that. And we just love You back, Lord. We love You and we thank You. Before I spoke, before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You have been so, so kind to me. Come on, let's sing this. Only over.
good that we could worship together and I hope that that was an encouragement to you today. Hey, uh, as a church family, we love celebrating some good stuff that is going on in the lives of uh, families within our church and people within our church. And so today we have got two babies that have arrived this week, which is fantastic news. We've got some pictures of some cute babies here. So congratulations to Tristan and Alex Johnson on the arrival of Ida Rose. There you go. And also a big congratulations to Shane and Beck Henderson on the arrival of Cody Tom, which sounds like a 1980s kind of um, police character to me. What a ripper. That's great. Cody Tom. So congratulations to both of those families and uh, I hope you're doing well. And also uh, within our church family, grandparents and aunties and uncles as well. So uh, great stuff for you guys. Talking about families, I want to invite you, if you are tuning in after our 9.30am stream today on Sunday, uh, One Hope Kids, you are invited to a Christmas in July party on Zoom immediately following this stream. So kind of from 10.30 onwards, get your dress ups, get, get your best elf hat on, whatever it is. Georgia and Sal are going to meet you there. And so parents, if you haven't got info about that, you can check out on the uh, One Hope Kids Facebook page. It's all there, ready to go. So invite you along to the uh, service afterwards. If the kids are being ratty or distracted, send them off. They can start working on their uh, costume now. I don't know, whatever it might be. I also want to acknowledge today as well, there's a, there's a number of people in our church family the last couple of weeks who have doing, been doing it pretty tough. Uh, just want to say our hearts are with you guys who have lost loved ones in, the last, uh, in recent times, the last couple of weeks particularly, and uh, for whom you guys, you know, you're dealing with the, uh, the challenge of having, you know, the practicalities of saying farewell with a, a funeral or celebration services, and you're in the midst of that, not only your own grief, but trying to work out how to do the numbers thing. And so as a church family, I want to say our hearts are with you. Also, for you guys that uh, we've got a number of our church family who are in uh, care at the moment and recovering in hospital. And so what it, wherever you are, whatever day you're watching this and joining in with church, we want to say hi to you. Hope you a speedy recovery. Wishing you all the best and we continue to pray for you as a church family. And, you know, we just, we probably can't understand the circumstances and the detail of your, you know, your grief that you're dealing with about not being able to have visitors in and see people and, you know, the discouragement that that probably is. But we want to say we're with you. We're cheering you on. And um, yeah, God is with you through the power of His Holy Spirit. And so that's a, that's a promise that you can grab hold of today. And in the midst of those challenges too, we are seeing some God do some incredible things in the lives of people in our church. And so I want to invite you, if, if that's you, if God's doing something great, we'd love to hear that and share that with other people if appropriate. And so great way to do that, just email, contact the church office, email info at onehope.org.au. And because uh, we want to encourage people in the midst of um, challenging circumstances for some and for maybe for many, God's still up to some great things. He is changing lives. He's he's making himself real to people who, you know, maybe don't have a faith right now. And so we want to celebrate that. We want to cheer that on and be praying into that as well. So I think that's all for me. Pastor Matt coming up in just a moment, finishing up, uh, I think towards the tail end of Acts. And so hang around, Pastor Matt up in just a moment.
Hi folks, thanks so much for joining us. Never a better time for us to gather around the Word of God. Well, today we're going to continue to look at the book of Acts, which is the story of the early Christian movement. The second half of the book of Acts focuses on the Apostle Paul, who's kind of the archetypal disciple of Jesus. For Paul, mission was everything. As I said last week, you know, Paul kind of saw his life as though he was a soldier that gets got dropped out of a helicopter in hostile territory to do a particular mission to be picked up on another hill. That's how Paul saw his life. It was all about mission. Today, I want to follow Paul on his journey as it's recorded in the last eight chapters of the book of Acts. It's an amazing story of twists and turns, which is why I'm going to try and capture it in one sort of big, broad snapshot. And uh, next week, actually, uh, Boaz is going to be looking at one particular part of that story, so we, we can look forward to that. The story begins at the end of an amazing two-year mission period in a major centre of the ancient world called Ephesus. It's on the west coast of Turkey. Uh, Paul has an amazing and very fruitful time here in Ephesus. But at this point, uh, at the end of this section, uh, the end of this time in Ephesus, Paul feels God's call to go to Rome. That's to the West. Now, Rome is important, of course, because it's the capital of the empire. And because the book of Acts is all about the advance of the Christian movement, Paul's arrival in Rome is going to be a kind of landmark moment. Um, it's a bit like, a, uh, a, for example, you know, an actor making it in Hollywood. Well, getting to Rome uh, is really a big deal in the book of Acts. And this isn't about Paul, of course. It's about the impact of the message of Jesus. Now, there was already a Christian community in Rome, but Paul is going to go and strengthen it and to the point where it's eventually going to become the center, uh, very key center of Christianity. Now, the interesting thing is that Paul had been trying to get to Rome for some time. He writes in his letter to the Romans, in Romans chapter 1, from verse, in verse 13, he says, I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that I planned many times to come to you, but have been prevented from doing so until now. Now, let's just pause here for a moment, because I think we can learn a lot about the Christian life from these details Have you ever felt compelled by God to go in a certain direction, a real sense of call, go in a certain direction, and then it's just like all the doors are closed. (laughs) You you just keep getting prevented from going in that very direction. Have you ever noticed that God isn't in a hurry? You know, Moses felt a call to save God's people, you know, in his youth. And so he jumped at a chance to kill a slave driver and start the revolution. But of course, that all went awry and he ended up being exiled into the desert for 40 years as a goat herder before he was able to come back and do anything. Well, it's not quite that long for Paul. Finally, anyway, after a couple of years in Ephesus, Paul feels that God is opening the way for him to go to Rome. But here's the catch. It was to be, at God's command, it was to be via Jerusalem. And there are a couple of of problems with this. First of all, Jerusalem is in the east. He's meant to be going west. Secondly, God tells him that he is going to be imprisoned in Rome. uh, Sorry, in Jerusalem. So how's that going to work? Have you ever noticed that God works in mysterious ways? Have you ever noticed that God seems to like taking the longest way to the destination? Here's what Paul says to the church in the church leaders in Ephesus, and I looked at this um, last week in Acts 20 from verse 22. He says, And now, compelled by the Spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. Now remember those words. 
And what follows now is an amazing story. And this is the story that I want to tell you today. The interesting thing about this story in its Greco-Roman context is the way that it speaks to a very well-known motif in Greek literature. Journey stories, particularly sea journey stories, were really popular at this time. And surviving a great sea journey was seen as a, as a sign of a person being particularly favoured by the gods. The cl classic examples, of course, are Homer's Odyssey and Virgil's Aeneid. Ancient stories also tended to show how one's fate, they believed in fate, these stories tended to show how one's fate was inevitably realised despite all efforts to thwart the inevitable. Think of the story of Oedipus, for example. Now, the Bible doesn't subscribe to the idea of fate as such. Rather, this is all about the faithfulness of God in fulfilling his promises. So, I love the way that God is speaking here through Paul to a non-biblically literate people in a language that they can understand. Of course, remember, the book of Acts is addressed to a high-born Roman called Theophilus. So this is, this is cast in a way that, you know, Theophilus really gets this and the key motives here. Paul comes out of this looking like the quintessential classical hero who is the beneficiary of an unthwartable divine favour and whose destiny is realised through all adversity. But the story of Paul is also very typical of many biblical stories in which God's plans are realised through all sorts of twists and turns and through all adversity. For those who know these stories, the story of Joseph, the end of Genesis through slavery and imprisonment, becoming the prime minister of Egypt, the story of Israel in bondage in Egypt, the story of Moses, the story of David. What these stories show us is a general pattern of life with God that applies to us as well. This is what the pattern of your life will be when you walk with God. God's purpose will be realised in your life, but it will be through adversity. And it will be a long and convoluted journey with many twists and turns in which God seems, in which, you know, where things just seemed at times to be going all over the place. But where God turns defeat into victory, where dead ends become avenues and loss becomes gain. Now take note of this. Because when you walk with God, this is the pattern of your life. This is going to be the pattern of your life. This is why it's important for us to look at these stories. Paul's experience here in Acts 20 to 28 is yet another biblical paradigm in a long sequence of biblical paradigms of what life with God looks like. So let's scoot over this story. So Paul heads for Jerusalem and all along the way, God warns Paul that trouble is up ahead. Now, this wouldn't have been a surprise for Paul because this was the message he had been taking to the churches that he'd planted. As it says back in Acts 14 from verse 21, then they, that's Paul and Barnabas back then, then they returned to Lystra, Iconium and Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, they said. Now, this doesn't mean that you earn your way into the kingdom of God through hardships. No, it's much more like the illustration that I used last week. When we become Christians, it's like we get deployed into a battle zone. We're like soldiers that get dropped out of a helicopter on a hill in hostile territory to complete a mission before being picked up on the other hill. And it's really important that we stay focused and vigilant with the bit in between the two hills because if we lose our focus, we miss our pickup. That's the consistent message of the New Testament. So God's reminding Paul here that there's trouble up ahead. He's going, I'm not going to be surprised by this. For example, in Caesarea uh, on the coast where Paul was staying with Philip, it says in Acts 21 from verse 10, 
After we had been there a number of days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. Coming over to us, he took Paul's belt, tied his own hands and feet with it, and said, the Holy Spirit says, in this way, the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem will bind the owner of this belt and will hand him over to the Gentiles. When we heard this, we and the people there pleaded with Paul not to go up to Jerusalem. By we, this is actually Luke writing this. Luke is traveling with Paul at this stage. So they're pleading with him, don't go. Verse 13, then Paul answered, why are you weeping and breaking my heart? I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. When he would not be dissuaded, we gave up and said, the Lord's will be done. Never heard that before. Okay, so how is all this going to work? That's the question. Okay, so Paul gets to Jerusalem and he finds that false reports of him had preceded his arrival. Uh, the false reports are that he's in some sense giving the Jewish faith away to the Gentiles, which is true, uh, but that is also teaching people to abandon the law. Uh, that's the false part. And that's a big deal uh, to the Jewish people. Now, this is in the late 50s AD. An anti-Roman sentiment is growing to the point of frenzy. Within a decade, this is going to erupt in a disastrous war uh, that's going to see the, the, uh, the Jews in, in that part of the world decimated and the destruction of Jerusalem, and uh, it's all going to end badly. But what we see already here is this, this kind of frenzy, this fanaticism already in this circumstance. All this escalates and Paul's presence stirs up a riot in which he's being basically torn apart by the mob until he's actually saved by the Romans, ironically. They save him from the Jews and they put him in jail in the Roman barracks. And so the prophecies are fulfilled. Here is Paul in jail in Jerusalem with thousands of Jews on the outside who can't wait to kill him. Well, looks like a dead end, doesn't it? Seems like God just loves a dead end. You see, what often seems to us as dead ends are actually avenues. Again, let's go back to the pattern. Think of Joseph's enslavement. Joseph's enslavement and imprisonment seemed like a dead end to God's promise of greatness to him. But it was this very imprisonment that led him to meeting the cupbearer that eventually gave him an audience with Pharaoh that led to his promotion. Moses' exile in the desert for 40 years would have seemed like a dead end to his aspirations to save his people. But it was here in the desert that he encountered God in the burning bush. And so it was a new Moses that emerged from the desert 40 years later to deliver Israel. The Red Sea seemed like a dead end to the Israelites who were fleeing the Egyptian army. But that very body of water became the pathway that led them to safety whilst destroying their enemies. David's exile and incrimination by Saul seemed like a dead end to him, to him becoming the king that God wanted him to be. But it was this very experience that actually made him the king that God wanted him to be. In God's economy, there is no better highway to your purpose than a dead end because this is where our power and our plans end and His power and His plans begin. So right here, as Paul is standing at his dead end in a Roman prison in the opposite direction to where he feels called to be, right here is when God speaks to him again. Acts 23, verse 11. The following night, the Lord stood near Paul and said, Take courage. As you have testified about me in Jerusalem, you must also testify about me in Rome. Paul, we're going to get there. Well, now what happens? Does he get released and off he goes? Well, no, it's never that simple. He's going to be transferred to Caesarea on the coast where he's going to spend, wait for it, another two years in prison. But here we see the other thing about this journey that has always been a constant factor. The ride may be rough, but all along you have God's protection and God's blessing. First of all, as in Jerusalem, these group of Jewish zealots make a vow not to eat 
anything until they have killed Paul. They're going to ambush Paul as he comes out to trial. Now, it so happens that Paul's nephew overhears the conversation. He reports it. And so Paul gets an escort, a milit full military escort of no less than 470 soldiers out of Jerusalem. And they take him to Caesarea. Talk about protection. And this also, this two-year period of imprisonment is a time of great revelation and productivity for Paul. This actually is when Paul writes a lot of his letters. A lot of the New Testament in our Bibles actually comes from this two-year imprisonment. It's also during this two-year imprisonment that a key promise of Jesus is fulfilled for Paul. Now, Jesus had promised his disciples in Luke 21, verses 12 to 13, that they would stand and give testimony of the good news before kings and governors. So there is this moment when the Roman governor Felix is being visited by the Roman puppet king Herod Agrippa II. And he thinks, well, I'll get Paul out and I'll get Agrippa to help me to make sense of this. And so there's this massive gathering. Here it is, Acts 25 from verse 23. The next day, Agrippa and Bernice came with great pomp and entered the audience room with the high-ranking military officers and the prominent men of the city. At the command of Festus, Paul was brought in. Then it says uh, in chapter, beginning of chapter 26, then Agrippa said to Paul, you have permission to speak for yourself. And what follows is the longest speech of Paul recorded in Acts. And it's before the leading people of the land. He is bearing testimony before kings and governors, exactly as Jesus had promised. The situation may have been hard, but Paul was being protected and blessed to be a blessing, to fulfill his purpose. Well, finally, after two years, Paul, who has as a Roman citizen who has a right to appeal to higher Roman courts, gets sent to the highest court and guess where that is? Rome. And he is sent with full military escort to Rome at the expense of Rome, a free ride. But here again, we see the same theme emerge that I've been talking about. Paul gets a free ride but he does not get a smooth ride. This, of course, is where we get the story of the great storm and the shipwreck. And this great storm comes upon the ship in the Adriatic west of Crete. Now, interestingly, just as an aside, I have actually experienced this storm in the, uh, in the 70s when I was a kid. Uh, we were sailing on a, I'm talking 100 foot square rigger ship, Brigantine. We were sailing north of Crete up into the Adriatic toward Izmir in Turkey. And we got hit, hit with a force 10 gale. I can remember as a kid, the waves crashing over the bow and, and we had uh, torn sails and everything. It was absolutely, got absolutely hammered. You know, we could, you know, we who live next to the Southern Ocean can think of the Mediterranean like a lake, <laughs> but actually it gets really stormy and these guys get hit with that very storm and it ends up in a, a shipwreck. And there's this moment in the storm where again God's promise comes uh, as God, uh, as, as um, Paul tells it to the crew in Acts chapter 27 from verse 23. Paul says, Last night an angel of God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me and said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar. There's the, there's the promise again. Kings and governors, you must stand trial before Caesar. And God has gracious, graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. So note this, they are all saved because Paul is there in the storm. Paul is an agent of blessing in the storm. God wants to make you an agent of blessing to people. So he's therefore going to put you in the same boat as them and in the same storms as them so that you can be a blessing to them. 
And even if you end up in a shipwreck with God, shipwrecks are not dead ends, but avenues to greater purpose. And this is what we see in this story. The ship that Paul sailed on was wrecked on the island of Malta, which leads Paul to living there over the winter. And a great number of people are brought to faith. There's like a spiritual revival on the island of Malta that would not have happened if it would not have been for this storm. Like it wasn't a pleasant experience, but it led to the fulfillment of purpose. And that's everything. Well, finally, Paul gets to Rome. And we, interestingly, we don't hear about the trial. Presumably, Paul is released. And then it says, and this is the last sentence in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 28, verse 30. For two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. He proclaimed the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. That's the last two words of the book of Acts, without hindrance. That's exactly what the story shows us. There's lots of hardship, there's injustice, there's mistreatment, there's imprisonment, there's storms, there's a shipwreck, but none of it is a hindrance not to God's purpose. In fact, all of these things even lead Paul to where he fulfills his purpose. Let me ask you this question. What sort of life are you going to live? There is a pathway before you, the only sure path to the only sure destination. The path of God where you walk with God, following Jesus, serving the mission of Jesus. Now it's a long and winding pathway and it goes through some tough places, but at all times, and this is the best thing about it, at all times, you will be with God. At all times, you will be protected by God, blessed by God to be a blessing to all you come across along the way. And that's the point. I'm going down that path. Let me finish with a section of Psalm 84. It's a beautiful psalm that depicts life as a journey, a pilgrimage through the desolate valley of weeping. In Hebrew, the word baka is used. Baka means weeping. Okay, so this desolate valley of weeping. Okay, the destination is Zion. That's the dwelling place of God. You know, we are, we are moving towards the dwelling place of God. That's the end point of our destination. We are going to go and be with the Lord. Well, listen to what Psalm 84 says, and I'll finish with this. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, who have set their hearts on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. They go from strength to strength until each appears before God in Zion. Come on, One Hope Church, let's take that journey together. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, Jesus. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Oh, we live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show. the 
hope God spoke to you, believing that He did through that message from Pastor Matt. And I love those words, the only sure, the, the, the only sure path to the only sure destination is following Jesus and serving His mission. And as Paul said, I have faith in God that He will do as He promised. That's a, that's a declaration that we can take into our week and uh, take with us, let it kind of stir our hearts and bring us comfort, bring us peace and maybe also challenge us as well. And so that's a good thing. Hey, also, if, you, if you're playing along with your, your preaching bingo, you can stamp that off. You've got a nautical reference again today. So there you go. Chung, done. Good one. So, hey, uh, if you are new to One Hope, you're checking us out. If there's anything we can help with, please uh, fill in a connect card online at onehope.org.au. We'd love to be in touch with you. If you've got any questions, support you, help you take steps in your faith, respond to what you've heard today, encourage you to do that. Also, kids, families, One Hope Kids Christmas in July party straight after our 9.30 a.m. stream. So hopefully you're almost ready for that. You can dive into that with Georgia and Sal and a bunch of other families. Have a great time there. And as always, if you've got something that you would love prayer support for, you'd love your church family to get around you, great way. Go to the website again, fill in a Connect card or contact us via the church office. And so hope you have a great day. May those words go with you that God is faithful. What He has promised is true to us, just as it was to Paul in the book of Acts. Take care, everyone. Look forward to seeing you soon.